All right. So uh, thanks for everybody for coming or staying. Uh, we're going to actually do this presentation together with Daniel. Uh, I'm Yuri Lelli, working for that RT group as, as Daniel. And uh, basically, I'm uh, looking after uh, SCAD deadline. Uh, how many of you actually never heard about SCAD deadline? OK, that's good, because basically, I have to assume your basic kind of uh, really comfortable with what SCAD deadline is. You don't have time for introduction. If you need more uh, like general info, please uh, ask me uh, in the next few days. Be more than helpful. Right. So actually, I'm basically here because uh, I uh, I know I already knew that there are a lot of things that uh, need still to be addressed and implemented to extend this uh, basically the bare uh, set of things that the kernel mainline already has. But then in Especially in last, well, I always wonder myself, but I, especially in the last few uh, months, I've actually been wondering, okay, but is this really useful? And that uh, basically, I got the answer this year. So there is, uh, I guess, I mean, it is useful so for someone, I guess, there are products that are actually using this. So then I thought, okay, so let's spend more time to actually extend and fix in thing and probably make this even more useful. I guess that's why we are here today. All right. So this is basically what I'd like to, what we'd like to to cover today. I basically handling the first half of these points, and then uh, uh, Daniel will do will do the rest. Um, right. So this seems to me uh, like the kind of the highest priority thing that needs to be addressed to possibly extend uh, uh, the usage of scheduling to more users. Uh, probably you already know that the only root uh, is actually able to use uh, the this scheduling uh, the scheduling policy as of today and uh, yeah so basically we have been asked on the real-time uh, mailing list uh, uh, why is it is that and what we can do to actually relax this uh, uh, this constraint and make the thing used by also normal users uh, there are basically two uh, two main points that actually uh, needs to be addressed before we can actually uh, be uh, safe in, re in basically relaxing the assumption. Uh, the first thing is that uh, currently we have uh, uh, a priority inheritance mechanism, which is uh, kind of I'd say safe for root usage. But then the same thing, uh, if that's actually used by uh, normal users, might be not so safe anymore. I'll explain why uh, right after this. And then uh, I guess another thing that needs to be uh, extended and improved is uh, how uh, we manage the uh, bandwidth associated with these non-root uh, users. You basically you have you, the root basically delegate in some way the available bandwidth uh, to uh, to users. All right. So uh, yeah, actually, there is also a third point over there. That is, uh, we currently lack uh, libc interface support for actually uh, calling the syscall, uh, the sched uh, cetera syscall. Uh, I actually sent uh, uh, a query uh, email in the libc alpha mailing list. Uh, so basically, extending the p thread wrappers, uh, it's, uh, it seems feasible. So those guys were saying, okay, yeah, I guess there is someone needs to do it, but it's actually feasible. So I guess it's one of the points we want to address. But to me, it looks like uh, uh, it's not really useful until we actually cover the other two points. Because, yeah. Anyway. Okay. So uh, what it means getting better priority inheritance? All right, so what's the problem? The problem is that uh, currently we implement uh, deadline inheritance, uh, which actually has some slightly uh, problems by itself. But let's say that uh, what we have is that uh, when uh, uh, when some when a deadline task basically blocks on a mutex, we can inherit its uh, its deadline. So basically, we inherit the priority. It's basically the, the extension of the fixed uh, priority uh, inheritance thing. 
And uh, the big problem with that is that uh, we also need uh, to basically relax the runtime enforcement of this boosted uh, task because basically we uh, want the thing to, basically the idea is that I want, I know that the thing is uh, inside the critical section, so I would like to the thing to finish as soon as possible. So I don't want to stop, stop it uh, while executing inside a critical section. And actually, I don't think there is much more that we can do uh, at this point, we, I mean, with, the, with this basic uh, mechanism. What we actually would need, uh, so let's say that the, the, the proper thing to, to be done is to actually inherit not only the deadline, but also the runtime. So basically, the idea is to inherit, be able to inherit but, uh, both the runtime period, so basically inheriting the whole uh, uh, bandwidth of the donors and use that uh, potentially to execute in a critical section. Uh, this will uh, uh, allow us to keep the runtime enforcement on. So basically that means that it will be safe to actually give uh, non-root users the possibility to use the, uh, the policy and also to deal with uh, uh, shared, shared data. And uh, basically, that means that uh, uh, we will, we would like to let the mutex owner uh, executing with the scheduling context information of who is blocked on him. And this, and this brings uh, us to the proxy execution concept. Um, yeah, I just uh, wanted to show you uh, like a simple example why uh, we want this and why what we have is bad. Basically, what can happen if you don't have any priority inheritance mechanism, you probably, I mean, already know this, but uh, what can happen is that uh, you have a low priority, uh, a low priority guy that is uh, entering a critical section because he's basically locking, uh, in this case, mutex A. Then uh, there is a higher, highest priority guys that locks the same, so it basically blocks on uh, mutex A so that low priority guys can continue executing the critical section, but while doing so, there is, a, for example, in this, uh, in this example, a medium priority guy that uh, is actually scheduled on the CPU because it's a higher priority than the lowest one because its deadline is actually uh, earlier than the lower priority. So it basically preempts the guy that he was actually executing. The problem is not that it's preempting, preempting the low priority one, but it's actually basically delaying the execution of the highest priority, priority guy. And actually in this case is causing a deadline miss in the highest priority one. Um, with what we have today, we can actually uh, fix this problem because basically the, uh, the low priority one will actually inherit the highest uh, priority deadline. The problem that we have today is that uh, since the lowest priority one is outside of runtime enforcement, he can actually continue executing for uh, how much time he needs or wants, and then can actually uh, be uh, jeopardizing the execution of whatever task, whatever else task actually needs to, uh, to run on the system. So that's bad as well. With priority, uh, with, uh, yeah, the proper priority uh, inherit uh, mechanism, which is proxy ex execution, what we can actually achieve is that when the uh, highest priority guy blocks on uh, mutex A, it will basically uh, give the lowest priority one the possibility to actually execute using uh, the highest uh, priority uh, process, uh, basically bandwidth. So in this case, uh, well, in this case, uh, uh, probably the system was uh, uh, bad design, so the highest priority one will probably miss uh, the, uh, the deadline as well, just because the lowest one was exceeded for, for too much, but at least the medium priority one will actually be able to complete inside his, uh, his deadline uh, parameter. Okay, so that's basically what we want to achieve. And the way we think uh, these uh, can be achieved is about to uh, I mean implement this process execution. Actually, I have to uh, thank uh, Peter because basically I started this this work based on his ideas and uh, patches. 
I guess the it's pretty complex thing, so I'll try to just uh, give you an overview of how it works. And uh, I guess one of the main points one to have to uh, understand for understanding how the thing works is that uh, uh, inside the task struct, uh, we can actually potentially divide between uh, information that pertains to scheduling. So all the information, for example, contained in the uh, task struct uh, DL, which points to the uh, SCAD deadline uh, entity information, where we actually track, for example, runtime and deadlines. And then there is another part which relates to the actual execution. So what information the, the scheduler and the system needs to actually run uh, a task properly. For example, affinity, I mean, respecting the affinity of the task is one of uh, those information that, uh, that is actually needed. And basically what we want to inherit uh, is the part of the, of the scheduling. So we want to be able to use the scheduling part to actually uh, execute the uh, boosted task on the, on the CPU. So if we go back to the example, uh, what does it mean is that uh, as soon as the uh, highest priority task blocks on the, on the mutex A in this, uh, in this case, it will let the lowest priority one actually ex continue running by using uh, his, uh, its uh, SCAD uh, deadline uh, information. So basically, low lowest priority one uh, will able to continue running at uh, basically highest priority, but still be running inside the highest priority uh, server, I mean, the, the bandwidth. Uh, how do we do that? Uh, basically, we use the, the mutex uh, as the point of synchronization, so we track what are the tasks blocked on the mutex, and uh, we actually have a mutex owner, so as soon as uh, uh, the mutex owner, for example, is preempted or something happens on the CPU. We go there and we try to select which one of the tasks that is blocked, currently blocked on the mutex, can be selected as the proxy for the mutex owner. Uh, I guess one thing to realize here, and it's a kind of big difference with respect both to how the current priority inheritance mechanism work, is that uh, the the tasks blocked on the mutex are not really removed, I mean, are not removed from the, from the RQ so that they can be selected by the scheduler. But when the basically the scheduler select one of those, we actually uh, kick the mechanism and then uh, basically use the, uh, the, the, the run, I mean, the, the scheduling information of the task that would have been selected for run, but we actually put the, the owner on the CPU to run. So that's basically the, the trick, let's say. All right. Um, right, so um, we basically addressing this from the point of view of trying to make uh, priority inheritance for deadline better. Uh, but personally, I think that uh, the mechanism itself might be actually more uh, general than just dealing with, uh, let's say, RTE priorities. So when you have uh, a mechanism that uh, uh, makes you able to use the scheduling information of other tasks to actually handle the uh, execution of some other task, you can in principle think to extend the thing to other, uh, to other type of information. For example, uh, yeah, nice levels for CFS, of course, are the priority, but also there is, uh, for example, a new proposition from, from Patrick. Uh, which uh, it's, uh, we which basically is a new interface with which a user can actually specify uh, utilization level for a uh, task or set of tasks, and those will influence, uh, for example, frequency selection or uh, load balancing decision in the future. In principle, we can actually think of using the proxy execution idea to let uh, those tasks uh, automatically inherit those. Uh, uh, those property. So, yeah, it might be more general than, uh, than originally intended. Okay, so that was it for, uh, for the process. So, for the first point I wanted uh, to cover, there will be an, uh, a slot in the afternoon uh, on the RT microconference. So, if you want to discuss more, there will be time there, or of course, stop me in the hallway. 
Uh, next things to cover is about uh, C group support. So currently, Deadline doesn't support C group. Inst uh, instead, it's uh, only using uh, the C school. So it's a one -on one to one association between uh, a, a data reservation, so bandwidth allocation and single uh, threads. Uh, having C group support might be helpful, and it might actually uh, mean two different things. Uh, you might be wanting to use C groups to just uh, basically do bandwidth management, to so allocate the available ma uh, bandwidth of the system to different users, or actually you want to use the the thing to actually perform hierarchical scaling. I'll explain in a bit what that means. Uh, so the simplest thing you 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 can do, and I actually uh, sent patches a while ago uh, on a mini lease, is. Uh, to basically let the system administrators uh, receive a fraction of the total bandwidth to users uh, using the same interface that actually RT, uh, so, so SCAD5 or, or RR already, uh, already have. Uh, this, uh, basically the scheduling itself is not uh, hierarchical, in meaning that uh, scheduled and entities will uh, still be treated at the root level, so as uh, single uh, tasks. But what you can use uh, is that uh, you can use the CPU uh, RT runtime and period uh, microsecond uh, files to actually, uh, I mean, split the bandwidth you are have available among your deadline tasks. So basically using the same interface to actually deal with deadline bandwidth. Uh, the in the implementation that I did, uh, basically th this requires RT group SCAD to be configured in. Not sure how widely that is used. Uh, that is one of the questions, yeah, that we want to. Yeah, so I will go. Um, yeah, so ideally we'd, we'd rip that thing out, but I, I've been hearing that people are actually sometimes maybe using it. Right. Which might be a bit of a problem. Yeah, that, that, yeah, I got the same impression. So it's. Uh, Docker guys are using RT group SCAD to to avoid the uh, causing starvation with uh, RT priority. Right. Or no, this all this was it this. Yeah. So I mean, I'm wondering why. Uh, I mean, if we want to remove it because uh, removing it will simplify things for implementing something, let's say, new. Uh, but then I guess uh, if we had to uh, support it, we had to. Uh, I mean, there is no point. I guess uh, maybe the next point that I'm going to cover might actually help in, uh, let's say, fixing uh, what RT SCAD group is actually doing. So, uh, but, but let's basically, that, that is the first thing that we might want to, to have. Uh, it might be useful because then uh, it's, it's already a way to give uh, system administ administrators a way to uh, manage bandwidth, but it might not be the only thing uh, needed. So the next thing that we want to probably have is a proper hierarchical uh, scheduling. Uh, of this, there, is, uh, there has been actually a posting by Alessio in, in the past on the mini list, uh, but then I guess development stopped a bit, uh, I guess it's time, time reason. Uh, what it does is basically creating a two level, at least in the implementation uh, scheduler. Uh, where at root level you have uh, both single entities and group entities. In this case, the second entity, which is a deadline scheduling entity, is actually associated to uh, with a group of tasks, and those tasks are actually uh, FIFO entities. What that does mean is that uh, basically the scheduler first selects the, the at root level, uh, considering basically priorities, so deadline priorities. And then you have to run a second level scheduler that uh, selects which one of the FIFO tasks needs to be, uh, to be run. Uh, the interface you use is the same uh, as, as of today. You just need to basically write the runtime period parameters and then you echo your task, I mean your FIFO task inside the tasks uh, uh, file in the in this group. Uh, why this might be helpful? This is a simple example. Let's say you have a pipeline of tasks. Uh, if you don't have the C group support, and that's basically what you have today is the uh, force plot, 
Then let's say if you have uh, four deadline entities uh, that all are basically part of this pipeline, what you have to do is uh, for each single entity, you have to go there and assign them runtime and deadlines. So that might be kind of cumbersome or even not possible because basically maybe you don't know uh, actually the, the, the single entity, the single entities, deadlines, and runtime parameters. So that might be actually uh, not very easy to uh, to use. Instead, if we have the group support, so the Reckic group support, you just need to specify a, a whole runtime over deadline, so just two parameters, that, that those are the, your group parameters, and then you put all your uh, FIFO uh, tasks that uh, are uh, basically composing your, de your uh, pipeline inside this uh, reservation, and they'll be basically handled. So basically, you, re you re reduce the, the problem of specifying, in this case, four couple of parameters to just one. So that might be helpful. Uh, I guess one of the problems that uh, at least the implementation that we had has is that while uh, having, for example, in this case, uh, on SNP system, of course, uh, you might speed up things because one of the stages of your pipeline might be running concurrently on different, uh, on different uh, cores. At the same time, uh, the problem is that uh, how the thing is implemented uh, today is that you actually reserve the fraction that uh, the, gr the group has asked, the fraction of bandwidth, on all the, on all the cores. So you might be wasting uh, bandwidth on the cores that, that are not actually used. There are different ways we can probably deal with that. For example, one thing we can do is that, uh, for, let's say that the CPUN is not used in this example. And uh, we can actually try to uh, use the leftover bandwidth in cases. We already have uh, this mechanism implemented in, in the in mainline uh, called Grub. So you basically reclaim the unused bandwidth. So that might probably help in this case. But it's something that we have to figure out and look at. All right. So yeah, that concludes my part. I guess we can do questions afterwards when we complete the whole thing. Yeah. Yeah. We have a, yeah. I have to enable Steve and Roasted. Okay. Oh, right. <laughs> okay, time is short. I will enable the Steve and Roasted mode here. So have the, re we will, okay. One of the ideas also is to rework the real time profiling to use the L servers which is something very similar to what uh, Yuri already explained, but we work on another level. So rather than working in the C group level, we would move that idea of hierarchical to the, okay, no, wait, I'm going too fast. <laughs> Return to Daniel mode. So what is the real-time throttling? Uh, the real-time throttling is a safeguard for misbehaving real-time tasks so they would not monopolize the CPU and uh, in such a way to starve normal tasks. So we have the, the period of one second by default, and we say that we can use 95% of the time running uh, real-time tasks. But if we run for this long, we will throttle the RQs, and then we will let the normal tasks to run. Why do we need it? We need it because there are some local per CPU tasks that need to run periodically to do housekeeping, like RCU threads, for example. So we need to, to left this room for the normal tasks. And also to not block us out of the system if a misbehaving real-time task runs forever and we cannot even stop it. So, okay, that's the case for single core where we have the runtime over a period for real-time real tasks and the space available for normal tasks, the rest. Okay, when we have the mood cores, uh, we have also this limitation, but we can take runtime for, from one CPU and move to another. So we allow the real-time tasks to run a little bit more. So for example here, we have a CPU with just a fewer deadline task that is not using all the available runtime. We can get this time moved to the other CPU that is full of real-time tasks. So this is the RT runtime share and it's enabled by default. So yeah, explaining things like this, we see that things work, so what is the deal here? So one of the problems that comes also from people that runs 
one busy loop in real time is that when we have the RT throttling enabled, we might have the, all the case in which the real time tasks are throttled to run nothing, to go idle. And so some of these uh, users, I'm not saying if they are doing the right thing by running busy loop on real time, but they exist. So they complain that by using the real time uh, Frothing and not using the RT real time share, we might have this undesired behavior in which we are throttling the RQs, the RQs of real time uh, threads to run nothing. And when we have uh, multiple CPUs, we might have also the case in which we take runtime from another CPU and run, but we don't, but we end up missing the fact that we can have uh, no real time tasks here and we end up uh, starving this task. So we take runtime from one CPU that, is, that has real time uh, available, move to another CPU, and it will allow the runtime tasks to run forever, starving CFS tasks, and causing RCU stalls and lock, that, uh, lock splits. So that's why we are thinking on reworking the real time throttling. So, Rather than implementing throttling as a way to, to throttle the, the real-time tasks or run queues, we will work in the same idea of the deadline, providing uh, runtime and the bandwidth for runtime ta for real-time tasks and non real-time tasks. So in the case that we will not, by using like for example, a root deadline scheduler per CPU in which we have a constant bandwidth server or any other server to provide runtime for these tasks and another to provide runtime for normal tasks, we would avoid postponing this task because it would have some runtime guarantee. And it will, because of the deadline property, it will be scheduled and not unthrottled. Like yeah, rather than, the, it will not run because it was throttled by this, because this was throttled, but actually because this has a priority and it will have the possibility of running. Uh, for example, we can have a 900 milliseconds uh, reservation for the real time tasks over one millisecond. Okay, it's, yeah, okay, over one second. And we can have like 50 milliseconds every second for the CBS, for the CBS of the normal tasks. So it will get its priority based on deadline. So in the future, this task will become the highest priority and it will be able to run. Oh, okay, this, this seems to resolve the problem of starving this task because it will have a reservation. But, okay, okay this, is, this is the, the baseline, but in the case that we don't run a normal task for the, all the time, we can reclaim the time uh, for running real-time tasks. So we will be able to resolve this problem by prioritizing this task using deadline, and this problem by using reclaiming, using the DL server. But uh, things are not as simple as it seems because, for example, this schedule here, as both the normal task and the real-time task has the same period, this timeline is also possible using the EDF scheduler because both have the same priority. I can schedule any of these reservations and this is also feasible, scheduling for the deadline scheduler. But this is not what we want. We want the, why we still have runtime for the deadline task? We want to prioritize this. And so we need another scheduler that it's not necessarily the EDF one as it is. So the schedule deadline, it doesn't directly applies for this case. And we need to find another way to schedule things on this way. One possibility is using the early deadline zero laxity, which is another schedule to resolve this problem. 
Or we can use somehow two levels out. Oh, and moreover, okay, we, we cannot apply the SCAD deadline. We need another scheduler, also based in deadline, but using another dynamic. And the, the first thing that comes to our mind by reclaiming here is to use what we already have on the SCAD deadline, which is GRUB. But that's not actually, it doesn't map directly here because, okay, this will take a long time to explain and I will skip, but believe me. The, <laughs> The CBS here would, uh, in this case, when we have, uh, uh, let's suppose that we have a deadline tasks running and they stop running because they are blocked on a, on a lock. Then the normal task would start running and they would try to steal time from this if we use Grub. And so it might end up running more than its runtime available. And so the deadline task would reclaim less time than it would be possible. But this requires a long uh, explanation, and we, I will skip because of time. But so this cat deadline does, uh, doesn't directly applies, and grub doesn't directly applies. So the baseline of the idea, we think it's correct to use the servers for the, the schedulers and prioritize the scheduler using the deadline. But we need to figure out another way to schedule to provide these guarantees because it will be the current uh, code that we have, have these drawbacks that we don't want to have. So this requires a lot of more reasoning. Okay, uh, I think we are out of budget already. Okay. Okay, sorry? Okay, so uh, another topic is improving the schedulability of the system. Okay, there are some, in the current scheduler we have either a global scheduler in which one scheduler takes care of all CPUs or we can separate a CPU and let it to run alone as partitioned scheduler. But in both of these cases there are some task sets that we could theoretically fit because they don't use all the CPUs but with either global or partition, this schedule is not feasible. We cannot uh, uh, schedule all tasks in such a way to deliver the response before the deadline. For example, with this task set, I using partition, I can put this task here, this task here, and try to fit this one. It does not fit here, neither here. So if I put this task on the CPU, uh, this, this will miss the deadline as well. So this task set doesn't fit in the, in the partition behavior. And it also doesn't, fix, doesn't fit in the global behavior because all the tasks has the same deadline. I, and uh, okay, running this before and this before is a correct behavior. I would not have time to run this. So this task set is, is not schedulable, neither on the global nor on the partition. So what people in the academic side are working to fix this problem? They are thinking on using a same partition scheduler. And the idea is that we can put some tasks pinned on CPUs, and when we don't have more time available to pin that, we split one task on two or more CPUs. For a offline system, which is not our reality because we have tasks arriving while the system executes, uh, Bjorn Brandenburg was able to use almost 99% of the CPU time. So it's, uh, he can fulfill, almost fulfill all the CPUs with real-time tasks while attending all the deadlines. And that's awesome. But it relies on something that we don't have, that is knowing all the real-time tasks on beforehand. Our system is an online system that can receive new real-time tasks as the system evolves. So this doesn't apply on our kernel. But a like uh, a relaxed way to do the same thing was already developed in the academic side by the people in Italy, uh, in Pisa. And uh, they did uh, one version of this, they based on this, but considering that the system can have more tasks arriving during the execution. 
And so how good is this approach that they developed? When the global EDF is on its worst performance, their scheduler, like it can run 50% of CPU time while attaining the deadlines. But on this same partition scheduler that they develop, the system can run up to 94% of CPU time of all CPUs and still uh, uh, giving the response time before the deadline. So we can schedule way more tasks using this approach. And even when the global EDF, for example, does very good, it's still slower, like it's still 30% lower than the same partition approach. So we can schedule way more tasks using the same partition than using global. And these other lines are just partition, which is also possible to the SCAD deadline, but still, they are all lower than the, than the same partition one. So for example, how does the same partition work? Let's suppose that we have that uh, task set that's not possible, neither on the partition nor on global. We can pin all these two tasks on the CPUs and they will always run here. And then we get this task here and split it into two reservations. One reservation will have three units of time rather than four, and it will have a constrained deadline of eight, so it will have a higher priority than the other tasks. And also this task here, it has, uh, okay, here we run three of the four, but we still need run the other unit of time. So we put the reservation on another CPU with a runtime of one, a constrained deadline of one, so once it migrates to the CPU, it will start running, and a period of nine. And in this case, for example, voila, we have a uh, scalability of that task set. That's not possible currently. So we are able to schedule more tasks using the same partition than the global and the partition one. So the good point of this is that the vast majority of the real-time problems are reduced to single core. And the single core scheduling is way easier to do than multiple cores. We have less overhead, less overhead because when we are running global, we are always trying to decide where to put tasks. And this decision takes time, like we are pushing and pulling tasks every time. And uh, we don't need to decide where to put the tasks, why the tasks are executing. Oh, five minutes, okay, we can do it. So we, we don't need to decide where to put the task because we already decided on beforehand when the task arrived. So we decide to put this part on the CPU and part on that CPU. So we don't need to take this decision in runtime. And this, this means low overhead. There is no need to pull tasks, just push tasks. And this reduces a lot the time doing this operation. And this operation takes the run queue lock and potentially can cause latency. So we have the side effect of not, not taking the logs of the scheduler too long, reducing the overhead of uh, the pool, and taking the scheduling spin logs uh, for a shorter time, and this helps to reduce latency, which is a good thing, may, mainly for things, for systems with a lot of CPUs. Migrations are bounded, but I will require to, to have more time to explain this, but Unless we, high, we are with a very high load of tasks, the system will mostly not migrate tasks. All the tasks will be pinned to CPUs. We will only start to migrate tasks as we go up in the utilization. So we have less uh, migrations because tasks are mostly pinned to CPU. And we were able to use affinities. Affinities come for free. We can use affinities for tasks and this is something that we don't have with a global scheduler. Uh, the point is that currently we have an admission control for the deadline task, but it is uh, sufficient but not necessary in the sense that we might accept a task set that's not actually schedulable, but this uh, the amount of time that we require to do this admission test is, is very slow, very low. 
but in this case, we will need to use the admission control, that is, the way that we split tests on CPUs. We need to put this in the kernel, and it needs to run in the kernel. And, but it's necessary and a sufficient uh, one. So it will turn the admission control complex, but this complexity takes time just in very few points, like when receiving a new task, or when resetting the affinity of task, or when hot plugging CPUs. But still, we need to bring this to the kernel, and it's a little bit complex. And uh, OK, we, in the current scaler and the same partition scaler, we might have problems with uh, constraint deadlines. And that's something that we need to think more. OK, we are running out of time, so I will skip the, the better tracing support. And uh, that's, that's all. Questions? And I'm, gl and I'm glad I skipped the tracing support because Peter Zuster is here and uh, <laughs> I want to be alive this afternoon. Well, uh, I guess everybody's hung more hungry than curious. <laughs> and it is getting on lunchtime, so let's thank both speakers.